And I've already read through the Bible for the year, and so I started again, so now I can make sure that I'm not reading my daily Bible reading, but reading in chapter of runs. All right. So chapter 46, chapter 46, there's going to be a, a, a blessed meeting between Joseph and his father. He hasn't seen him since he was, what, 17 <laughs> years old, I think it was. I don't remember exactly. We have to go back and look at it. But he's now in his 40s and uh, hasn't seen his dad. He was sold as a servant and he's gone to Egypt. And then he was raised uh, by God's glory. He was raised to be the second uh, in the kingdom of, of Egypt. And now he's uh, uh, been able to God has given him the knowledge to understand by Pharaoh's dreams that there would be seven years of plenty, and they've saved up for those seven years of plenty. And uh, now it's going to be seven years of famine that it says is going to consume all of those seven years of bounty that they had. Now keep in mind that when they were saying that God was going to provide seven years of bounty, it meant that he was going to provide seven years of more than they could ever need or want, you see. But then there was going to be seven years of famine, and the famine was going to be so uh, uh, terrible that it would be uh, consuming all that they had. And they're two years now into it, and Joseph knows at this point that... Uh, there's still five more years of famine to come that's going to devour everything that's in the land. And, and uh, he asks uh, Pharaoh uh, for his family to come. And Pharaoh's, yes, bring them, you know. And, and so here they are in chapter 46. Now, remember by this time, Joseph's dad is, uh, uh, Jacob, has been renamed by God Israel. And that's where we get the name of of the nation of Israel to this day is from Jacob. And it says, And Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here am I. And he said, I am the God of uh, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make thee a great nation. I will go down with thee unto Egypt, and I will also sojourn, I'm sorry, and I will also surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. And Jacob rose up from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried Jacob, their father, and their little ones and their wives in the wagons which Pharaoh had sent and carried him. And they took their cattle and their goods, which they had gotten in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt, and Jacob and all his seed with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all the seed brought he with him into Egypt. So, <clears throat> notice here, I found this very interesting, that God said uh, earlier to Jacob, Thy name shall no longer be Jacob, but shall be Israel, because you shall be a father of many nations. And so this chapter starts out, And Israel took his journey. But notice that when God spake to him, he spake to him on the personal level. Jacob, Jacob. You see, God deals with us in two sides, you see. He doesn't just deal with us in our spiritual, but he also deals with in our, and takes care of us in the flesh, you see. See, when you look at Israel, Israel is his spiritual given name that God's given him because he's going to be a father of many nations. 
But when God's appealing to his weak human form, God calls him Jacob. He goes, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, here am I. Jacob, Jacob, and he, here am I. I'm here. You know, that's the same thing that God said to Samuel and to all the other ones. He, he'd call them out by name, and they and remember Samuel used to run over to Eli and says, yeah, Eli. And he goes, uh, he goes, well, next time, don't, don't come in here. Just say, I'm here for the, thy servant hero, you know. And so Samuel would listen. Same thing here. Jacob knew God's voice. Jacob knew when God was talking to him. And Jacob also knew that God was, uh, was going to take care of him, and he wanted to see his son. But notice that God had also told him to stay in the promised land. And this is God giving him license to go to Egypt. You see, even though Joseph wanted to go to Egypt and he was starting on that journey, there was his spirit was, was uh, convicted. I, am I disobeying God in doing this? Am I disobeying God to, to do what I want to do? Because uh, we struggle with that in our lives all the time, our flesh, don't we? What is it that I want to do versus what God wants me to do? And it's a very hard thing. But God speaks to him by that night in a vision, it says. And he says, Jacob, Jacob, speaking to his flesh, you see. Because he knows that he wants to see his son. And, he sa and Jacob says, here am I. And he says, I am God. Remember, God always says, I am. Jesus is the great I am. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make thee a great nation. That's a promise that, that God is giving to Jacob. Jacob will never see his home again in his lifetime, you see. He's going down to see his son so that he may die. Look at the end of the last chapter there. It says, and Israel said, it's enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go see him before I die. Jacob is 120 years old. 120 years old. You notice that Jacob doesn't just get up on a, on a, a, a horse or on an, a donkey or anything like that and ride off to go see his son. It says here that that he was so old and stricken in age that his sons had to pick him up and put him in the wagon. But his sons obeyed, didn't they? And his sons and his sons' sons were going to go with him and his daughters and his daughters' uh, daughters-in-laws. And it says, in verse 8, And these are the names of the children of Israel, which came into Egypt, Jacob and his sons, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and the sons of Reuben, Hanok and Palu, and Hezron, and Carmi, or Carmi, and the sons of Simeon, Jemuel, and Jemin, and Ohad, and Jachin, and Zoar, and Shal, the son of, the, of a Canaanite woman. And the sons of Levi, Gershon, and Kohath, and Merari. And the sons of Judah, Ur, Onan, Shelah, and Perez, and Zerah. Now we remember Judah, remember Perez and Zerah? Remember Perez is in the lineage of Christ, as we read in Matthew chapter 1. Perez and Zerah. But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan, and the sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. And the sons of Issachar, Hola and Puva and Job and Shimron. And the sons of Zebulun, Sarad and Ilion and Jesiel. And the sons of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob in Padanaram, with his daughter Dinah, all the, all the souls of his sons and his daughters were thirty-three. And the sons of Gad, Ziphron, and Haggai, and Shunai, and Ezebon, Eri, 
Arodai, and Ariel, and the sons of Asher, Jemnah, and Ishual, and Isui, and Berah, and Sirah, their sister, and the sons of Vera, Heber, and Malkiel, and these are the sons of Zilpha, whom Laban gave to Leah, his daughter, and these she bare unto Jacob, even sixteen souls. The sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, Joseph, and Benjamin. And unto Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, which Asina Nath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On, bare unto him. And the sons of Benjamin were Bela, and Beker, and Ashabel, and Ger, Gera, and Nema, and Elia, and Roash, uh, Mithim, and uh, Humphim, and Er. And these are the sons of Rachel, which were born to Jacob. All souls were fourteen. And the sons of Dan, uh, Hisham, and the sons of Nathavli, uh, Jaziel, and Gunai, and Jazir, and Shilim. <coughs> these are the sons of Bilhah, which Laban gave unto Rachel his daughter, and she bare these unto Jacob. All the souls were seven. All the souls which came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins, besides Jacob's sons' wives, and all the souls were threescore and six. Sixty-six. Threescore and six. And the sons of Joseph, which were born in Egypt, were two souls, and the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were threescore and ten, so seventy total that came with him, including his servants and everything. And he sent Judah before unto Joseph to direct his face unto Goshen, and they came into the land of Goshen. So here we have 70 going in to Egypt. We'll get here very shortly in a few <laughs> weeks into uh, the, uh, the exodus. And when the exodus comes, several million come out of Egypt. So the Lord prospered them while they were in Egypt. And the Lord prospers us when we're here in this world. If you'll trust in him and follow him as your savior. You see, this world is like a picture of Israel going into Egypt. And we, just like Israel, are about to come out of Egypt and we're going to go into the promised land. You see, which is heaven. And boy, I just got done with the book of Revelation, and heaven's going to be grand. Talks about the new Jerusalem is four square. It's just as high as it is wide, as which is long. It's a big cube, and it's going to come out of heaven and land on the earth. It's going to be on a new earth, and the new earth is so big that this, according to the measurements of this new Jerusalem, it's going to be as wide as about half of the United States is in size. So it's huge. But you think about it. The new earth has got to be huge for all of those saints through time that have trusted in the Lord as their Savior. You see? Just amazing to think about what heaven, the new heaven and the new earth is going to be like. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be beautiful. But here, Joseph has been provided by God to save his people. See, it's a picture of Christ. Joseph was in all wise tempted, but yet he didn't sin in those temptations. Now, I'm not saying that Joseph was a perfect man. He did sin in some ways and the other, but Jesus never did. But Joseph is a picture. It's a similitude of what God's doing for us. God likes to paint pictures. He likes to give us analogies and show us uh, similitudes of what he's going to do for us. You see, he gives Joseph promises here that go, go ahead and go into Egypt 
and I will keep you, and I will bless you, and I'll multiply your seed. That's the promise that he gave him. It's also the promise that we have in this world. If we trust in the Lord as our Savior, and if we uh, are fruitful and tell others about Christ so that people might be saved, we're going to be blessed. You see? By trusting in Jesus and being patient and just waiting on what his promises are, he will bless us in this world. We're dwelling in Egypt right now. And aren't we looking forward to the time when we go through the promised land? Sometimes dwelling in Egypt feels like we're dwelling in the wilderness, doesn't it? You know, right at the end, right before they went into the promised land, it was a wilderness. You know that? It wasn't very fruitful. How much crops did they grow during that time? They just wandered around with their sheep, and they fed them, and they ate them. But God protected them and took care of them at those particular times. You notice that? Even though it seemed like there wasn't much productivity. In fact, he was so angry with the one generation that he let them all die in the wilderness. And raise up a new one. So we need to teach our children to do what's right. And not to yield unto those things of this world that are, or that are wrong and moral, that are sin. And so here, Joseph, it's given the lineage of 70 souls coming out of Egypt, or coming out of Israel, actually coming out of where the promised land was promised, but yet not given, and going into Egypt. Promises made, now they're in Egypt. And so, they're heading into Egypt. And so Judah has been sent before unto Joseph to direct his face into Goshen. And they came into the land of Goshen. And Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, to Goshen and presented himself unto him. And he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. Can you imagine what that must have been like, that reunion? Joseph just learned that his son was still alive. Joseph just learned that his son was now second in command of the land of Egypt. Joseph says, I mean, Jacob says, I'm going to go see my son Joseph before I die. And they take him to, uh, take him to uh, Egypt and present him before his father. And it says that they, Joseph came up to him. You know, Joseph was a busy man. He was busy taking care of the land of Egypt. But he got in his chariot and he went to go see his father. He went to go see his father. You know, it's a kind of important thing. He hadn't seen his father in years. Didn't have the opportunity. But now he has the opportunity. Boy, I think there's some people in this life that wish that they could go visit their father or their mother. Just talk to him one more time. And Israel said unto Joseph, Now let me die. My goals are complete. Let me die. Since I have seen thy face, because thou art yet alive. And Joseph said unto his brethren and unto his father's house, I will go up and shew Pharaoh, and say unto him, My brethren and my father's house, which are in the land of Canaan, are come unto me. And the men are shepherds, for their trade hath been yet uh, hath been to feed cattle, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. And it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you and say, and shall say, What is your occupation? That ye shall say, Thy servants trade and hath been about cattle from our youth even until now, both we and also our fathers that ye may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Isn't 
See, Joseph had it all figured out. You just tell them that you're shepherds, you know, they then you won't they won't want you to dwell in the city with Pharaoh, you see. Go and just tell them the truth. Tell them what you are. You're, you're shepherds, lowly shepherds. And uh, Pharaoh will give you the, the good fields of the land to feed your cattle in Goshen. You see? Joseph knew exactly what his family, how they lived, and they were nomadic. They lived in tents. They had animals. They took care of those animals. Nothing wrong with that. But see, the Egyptians, you know, they had gotten uh, accustomed to uh, living in the cities and having the good good of the land. And, and uh, the servants were the ones that lived and worked out in the fields, you see. Kind of, uh, that's always been the two classes of people. People that like to live on the earth, on the land and take care of animals. And those who like to live in tall buildings and live life of luxury. And very few do those two worlds meet, you see. But when you have opportunity that both worlds meet, well that gives you a, quite a perspective about things in this life. The Egyptians didn't like to get out in the dirt, you see. They didn't like to get out and chase those stinky animals around. They sure like to eat them, though. You know? They sure like to eat them. Somebody's got to do it, you see. Things haven't changed a whole... More of the, more of the things you talk about, how things have gotten so much more... Uh, modern and stuff nowadays, and things pretty much haven't changed in all these thousands and thousands of years. Remember, this is way before Christ was born. See? But already at this particular time, the lineage of Christ, as we read in Matthew chapter 1, is taken right here. Remember, it talked about Judah. And Judah had two children, two boys from Tamar. One was named Pharaoh, and Pharaoh is in the lineage of Christ. You can read it right there in Matthew chapter 1. And when Jesus comes, Jesus will come, and they'll call his name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And it also says in the book of Isaiah that his name would be Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us. If there's any religions out there that don't believe that Jesus is God, well, right there, God, the first thing that he says is, his name shall be Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. God loved us so much that he became a man just like us. God himself became a man, born of a virgin. God sent his spirit to bring the seed into Mary's womb while she was yet a virgin because it broke the lineage of sin of man. You see, mankind, ever since Adam sinned, Children are born sinners because their fathers are sinners. Yes, fathers, it's on you. And the daughters are sinners because their fathers were sinners. Yeah, fathers, it's still on you. You see? But Jesus, God himself, it says before she was had ever known a man, was conceived by the Holy Ghost. God himself put the seed in her womb. And she brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus, because he would save his people from their sins. Now, a lot of people say, well, who's his people? His people 
who he saves are those who are willing to humble themselves and submit to God's word and to ask God to forgive them of their sins and realize that they're a sinner in need of a Savior. If you'll humble yourself before Almighty God, He will lift you up, it says. His people are those who are humble and ask Christ to come into their heart and save them, repenting of their sins. And it says, Whosoever shall come unto me, I will in no wise cast out. God will save you. That's who he's came, he came to save. That's who he came to save. You notice in the another similitude here between Joseph and, the, and Jesus Christ. It said that Joseph said to tell the Pharaoh that you're shepherds. And who did Jesus notify? He notified some wise men. Did he notify Herod? Did he notify the high priest? Whose responsibility was it to know the high priest and the scribes and the Pharisees? But they were busy about what they wanted to do. God loves the shepherds. He sent his angels. These shepherds were watching their flocks by night. And it says, Lo, the glory of the Lord showed. Must have been a sight. And those shepherds, they were, Woohoo! Let's go. After, the, after hearing the word about Christ being born and he's in the manger, you'll find him in a the manger there in Bethlehem. Those shepherds were like, Let's go see what the Lord just told us about. They went and checked it out. The shepherds came. All through the Bible, the Lord loves shepherds. You ever notice that? David. Remember when David became king and he was lifted up and haughty and he sinned with Bathsheba? What did God bring back to his memory? Remember when you were the shepherd out there? chasing after those sheep. And he knew when he gave David that analogy that J David would cry because it broke David's heart. Because David remembered when he was low and how the Lord dwelt with him. And here he was, he'd become a king and he'd been foolish. He'd let his flesh run his life, and he'd been foolish. Sometimes we need to do that in our life. We need to reflect on how foolish we've been and get back to being a shepherd. Get back to basics. Get back to what God called us to. You see? It's important. That's why God loves the shepherds. Because the shepherds understand that those sheep are going to die if you don't take care of them. That's the heart that God has toward us. We'll die if God doesn't take care of us. You see? There's a sad day coming for those that don't trust in the Lord as their Savior. Because they don't have a shepherd to take care of them. And when the wolves come, they're going to tear them and eat them. And no shepherd to defend them. To take his rod and beat that wicked wolf or lion or bear that's trying to take one of those lambs. The lost world doesn't have a clue that they need the shepherd. 
but they know oh, they need the shepherd. That's the reason why Jesus came 2,020 years ago to this earth, God himself. He was 100% man. He was 100% God. You remember when he was tempted in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights. The devil tried to tempt him, tempt him by his flesh. Just like every mankind. And Jesus in all ways was tempted just like we are. I, I know that you're hungry. Why don't you turn this stone into bread? And Christ answers, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. You see, food can't satisfy you. It's temporary. But when God satisfies you, it's permanent. He's always there. It never goes away. If you trust in the Lord as your Savior, He's always there. It says that you have a comforter. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it. Sometimes He allows us to go astray. If you won't listen, He'll let you go astray. But He lovingly puts out His staff with the hook on it, and He grabs us around the neck, and He pulls us back in. Whom the Lord loveth, He correcteth. My Uncle Don, I was talking to him this week. He says, whom the Lord loveth, he corrected. The Lord must love me a whole lot. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, that's a good way to look at it. Seems like his whole body is failing him. But whom the Lord loveth, he corrected. The Bible says that trials that come in this life are for our good. They're for our benefit. Amen. You see, we don't always see these things as, as good. But Joseph understood. He went through the trial of being sold by his brothers as a slave. He went for through the trial of being accused of doing some inappropriate things with a man's wife, and he didn't. And he got thrown in prison. I have a feeling that, that man understood what had happened. Otherwise he would have been executed. But he was put in prison. And believe it or not. Believe it or not. He interpreted that dream. I don't think Joseph wanted to be the second command of Egypt. That's a lot of work. You ever been put in charge of some project? I, I don't know of anybody who's been in, put into a, a, a project of a high task, like being President of the United States or anything. If they, if they are uh, wanting that and not, uh, uh, and not have, uh, being worried about it in any form, then they're not a man. They're just cra they're crazy. Because that's stressful. It's a trial. I mean, how many times do you see presidents go through and they start out with, you know, maybe a little bit of dusting of white, and then they end, they're all their hair is white. You know, I mean, brings up the gray hairs of their head. Yeah. It's a stressful job. Joseph was put second in command. By Pharaoh, it says that he was like a father unto Pharaoh, because Pharaoh saw wisdom. He saw that Joseph had something that he wanted, and that was wisdom. And there's a lot of people who go through this life thinking that they got wisdom. They say sorts all sorts of things out of their mouth, and it's like, blah. But there's no wisdom there. You know how come there's no wisdom? Because the litmus test for what wisdom is, is the fear of God. And without the fear of God, there is no knowledge. And without the fear of God, there is no wisdom. Proverbs. That's why this world is in the, such a state that it is. Pray for our country. Pray for our world. Because there's so many people that need to know the Lord is their Savior. 
That's the reason why I like to point out here about Joseph and his relationship, uh, the picture of what Christ did for us. You remember Christ came down from heaven, was no pomp and circumstance. In fact, if you were somebody who was rich, and I'll just tell you right out, Joseph's family, and as far as things go in those day and ages, was rich. They had sheep. And when they had a lamb that was born without blemish and without spot, it was firstborn, that was God's lamb. And that lamb would be sacrificed unto God. That would be like taking your money, your, your first fruits of your money, and giving it to God as a tithe. They would offer that lamb as a sacrifice. And that was to be a picture of what Christ was going to do for us on the cross. You see? It sounds terrible, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, because the devil likes to sacrifice things, you see. But he does it in a wicked way. But this way was a picture of what Christ was going to do for us without blemish and without spot. It was a beautiful picture, you see, this lamb. These shepherds would do this. We understand by sacrificing animals what that all means, and you eat your food. There's so many in this world that think that you just go down to the grocery store and you pick out what's already wrapped in a nice plastic bubble wrap. What kind of sacrifice is that? You see? I don't know about any of you, but if you've ever slaughtered an animal, it hurts a little bit. If you have any kind of compassion at all, you don't do it lightly. You see? That's the reason why we haven't had any lamb chops here. Because my girls have named all of our sheep. And we couldn't bear to eat them. But if things got bad enough, we'd have to, you see. But this was the way of life. Before grocery stores. You see. Their men were shepherds. Jesus came to this world, he was born, and those that had money or flocks would sacrifice a lamb without blemish, without spot. Jesus' parents sacrificed a turtle dove or two young pigeons, I can't remember what it was, but they sacrificed birds in a substitution because remember Joseph or Jesus was the firstborn son the firstborn son was God's until that sacrifice was made in replace you see according to God's law and because they were poor God provided a substitute they could either have a turtle dove or two young pigeons and that's what they sacrificed the eighth day it said And Jesus was circumcised. And Jesus grew, it says he became, as he grew, and the, the, um, his parents went to sacrifice at the temple, and he was there in the temple, and he was dis discussing with the scribes, and they were marveling about how much of the scriptures he knew. Well, because God himself wrote those scriptures. Jesus knew more than they did. But notice that he said that he took on a form of a servant. He didn't go around going, I know more than you guys do. You see? That was the example that Joseph gave. That's how we know that Joseph was not as wise as Jesus and the fact that Joseph went and said, uh, well, I, I had this dream that you guys were going to bow down to my sheath. Your sheaths are going to bow down to my sheath. You see? But Jesus didn't 
You see? Jesus knew more than them, and he was not boastful and proud about it. He was humble. God loved us so much that he sent his son to die on that cross for sin. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent forth his son to this world not to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. That's what we're all here for, you see. Are you going to be a servant that will be willing to serve God for all eternity? Or are you going to be stiff-necked and want to do things your own way and refuse the free gift of salvation and go through this life enjoying what you want to enjoy to spend it all in the lake of fire? which was only reserved for the devil and his angels who disobeyed God. But see, God created this world so that he might have servants that would love him, genuinely choose him. You know that? Nobody loves somebody who isn't nice to them all the time. But when somebody chooses them and prefers them and loves them, that's who the Lord loves, you see. That's who God loves. God loves those who are going to want to be with him, you see. That's the way it is. God's just like we are. He, you know all the emotions and feelings that you have? He created them because they're in Him. That's why when you disobey Him and go off another way and serve other things, He's jealous. He, is right, he has a righteous jealousy. All right, let's all stand. Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? He's right there. If you'll draw an eye to God, he will draw an eye to thee. If you are saved and you're, you're living in sin, he says that if you'll confess your sins, he is willing and just, he's willing and able to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God wants you to dwell. He wants to take care of you. He wants to bless you. He doesn't want to always be correcting you, but as we know, the Lord, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. He will correct you because he loves you. Get you back on the straight and narrow path. But if you're lost today, there's only one path for you, and that's to Christ. If you don't trust him as Savior, you're going to go, I should say there's two paths. The other path is the wide way that everybody is on unless they accept Christ as their Savior. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. It's right all right there in John chapter 3. We all know John 3.16. But read the whole chapter. There's a lot of good in there. God loves you so much that he wants you to trust in him as your Savior. He wants you to repent of your sins and ask him to come into your heart and save you, and he'll do it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you that we could be here in your house. Lord, I pray for those that are lost in our midst, Lord, that they would uh, come to know you as Savior. Lord, I pray for those that uh, we know in our daily walk that we love and we want to tell them the truth and we want them to come to know you as Savior. Lord, I just pray that they would uh, the seeds that have been planted for the things that have been spoken, that they will come to know you as Savior before it's eternally too late. Lord, I pray that you be with our little church. Help us to grow. Pray for our nation. And pray for all the things that are going on in the world. And Lord, I just pray for another great revival before you return. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. We're dismissed.